In the late 1990s and through to the mid-2000s, the graphics card market was a very different space. Besides ATI and NVIDIA, several other companies were in the business of designing and producing discrete graphics solutions. One such company was 3D Labs. What would become 3D Labs started out in the 1980s as benchmark technologies, before being bought out by the DuPont Chemical Company, where the group would go on to form DuPont Pixel Systems. DuPont Pixel Systems made a name producing various top-end professional video products, particularly S-Bus board upgrades like the GL Engine 24 XP for Sun Microsystems workstations, intended for providing compatibility with silicon graphics applications, files, and workflow. In 1994, a management buyout transformed DuPont Pixel Systems into the 3D labs most are familiar with, and in November 1995, they released their first consumer graphics card, the Game Glint, a scaled-down version of their previous professional chipsets, which would go on to power the Creative Labs 3D Blaster VLB. Most familiar with 3D Labs, however, will know them for their Promedia line of graphics chips, beginning in 1996 with the Promedia and Promedia NT. Even these value-oriented designs were better suited for 3D and computer-aided design applications, with the Delta Geometry coprocessor ill-suited for gaming performance. The Promedia, however, was one of the first consumer graphics cards with full OpenGL driver support instead of a mini-port or subset of the OpenGL standard. The Promedia 2 would release in late 1997 and improve upon the original Promedia with a revised architecture, AGP texturing, and 32-bit color depth. But, like its predecessor, the Promedia 2 performed poorly in gaming applications like Quake 2 and 3. The Promedia 3 and Glint R3 would complete the Promedia line in 1999, with the Promedia 3 geared more towards Direct3D 6 compliant gaming, and the Glint R3 oriented for professional applications in cards like the Oxygen VX1. Neither of these would be great for gaming in comparison to contemporary offerings, failing to even match the NVIDIA Riva TNT or ATI Rage 128 GL. It was around this time that 3D Labs would, much like 3DFX, discontinue licensing their designs to third-party board manufacturers, opting to instead produce all their cards in-house. 3D Labs would go on to purchase the intense 3D division of Intergraph and their Wildcat line of graphics chips in July of 2000. Only two years later, 3D Labs would be acquired by their old partner Creative Labs in June of 2002. Over the next several years, 3D Labs would focus on the Wildcat and Realism lines of professional graphics cards, and in 2005, 3D Labs would go on to release their final most powerful discrete graphics card to date, the Wildcat Realism 800. Before getting into benchmarks of the Realism 800, a brief technical overview of the card is in order. The Realism 800, when released, was an absolute beast of a card for its intended applications in 3D modeling, rendering, and computer-aided design applications. It came armed with dual visual processing units, connected by one vertex scalability unit and 640 total megabytes of GDDR3 memory of which 128 megabytes were dedicated for the VSU connection. The way the dual VPU setup actually works is that those 128 megabytes of GDDR3 direct burst memory hold the rendering commands and geometry data for the VSU as it handles all scene splitting tasks in its breaker distributor. Full hardware utilization does not require software support. The VSU splits the frame first, then processes the graphics, and sends data to the VPUs over two 64-bit parallel interfaces. Admittedly, a fairly unique solution. With the technical specs out of the way, how does the setup actually work for games of the era? Because after all, that's what we're really interested in. Well, not that great actually. As was said before, this was a workstation card first and foremost. And even with support for OpenGL 2.1 and Direct3D9 in the latest 3D Labs driver, which is still available on their archive site, performance is noticeably poor even in period-correct games. That being said, the driver suite that is available provides some interesting features and information, such as chip temperature readings, as well as OpenGL options for full-scene anti-aliasing. 
And in terms of the professional side of things, there's a number of preset display options available for suites of software that were common at the time of the card's release. However, in terms of entertainment and DirectX options, things are pretty bare bone, as to be expected. The first two games tested on this card didn't launch at all. Far Cry appeared to attempt to launch before simply disappearing and going straight back to the desktop, despite numerous attempts at fixing it, and Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2 simply errored out and refused to work at all. The next game in the test suite, however, did run and play, and at a semi-decent frame rate at that. In Medal of Honor Pacific Assault at 640x480, the frame rate averaged pretty darn close to 30 for most of the time. Technically playable, but not the greatest experience. Can it run Doom 3? Well, yes, it launches, and performance was actually surprisingly good given the past experiences. That's not to say it was great, far from it, but it at least ran and wasn't a slideshow. And I'm sure with some of the modifications that could get this game running on cards like the Voodoo 2, you could probably eke out a bit more performance in this game.
1280 by 1024 high settings, we barely even scratched 20 FPS on average. But, after dropping the settings and resolution down a bit, we yield a much more playable frame rate hovering around 40 FPS most of the time. Unfortunately, in another favorite title of mine, Sid Meier's Pirates, frame rates at pretty much any setting I tried were not that great. Maybe there's something I'm missing, but it just seems that the Realism 800's drivers just do not like this game. Still, with Sid Meier's Pirates gameplay style, it's largely playable, but not the most enjoyable experience. YouTube playback on the Realism 800 actually surprised me. In the latest version of Firefox on Windows XP, 720p HD video was very much doable. Maybe not 60fps, but 30fps was absolutely fine. Now how about another Doom title? Doom Slayer's Testaments is a Quake Engine based game inspired by the 2016 reboot and Doom Eternal, with fast frenetic action definitely deserving of a look if you're interested in more Doom. And on the Realism 800, it runs far better than Doom 3. But alas, even Slayer's Testaments does not provide a perfect 60fps locked experience. One can find other benchmarks of the Realism 800 in games of the era or older and see the same mediocre performance in spite of the card's complex hardware and hefty $2,000 to $2,799 launch MSRP. Really, this should be expected. Of course measuring this card in gaming won't go well, as it was intended for professional 3D applications. And well, period reviews of the card for professional use are generally favorable lauding impressive speedy performance in applications like Maya 6.5, 3ds Max 03, Autodesk Lightscape, and other tools of the time. The Realism 800 even beat out competitors in many benchmarks, like the Quadro FX4000 by substantial margins, albeit at a higher cost. But the fact that even the Realism 200 could beat or match the Quadro FX4000 in a lot of these benchmarks at potentially half the cost really speaks to the quality and power of 3D Labs offerings, which really makes one wonder how far they could have gone. And that's the power of the Realism 800, 3D Labs most powerful and final video card. An absolute beast of a final card that, sadly, doesn't hold up all too well. It runs hot, requires a lot of power, and there are better era-appropriate alternatives for both gaming and workstation purposes. In 2006, 3D Labs would announce a shift in focus to solely developing its media processor business, and in 2009 was rebranded as Z Labs, which was later largely parted out to Intel in 2012 for $30 million. Regardless of the shortcomings of the Realism 800, it's a fascinating piece of computing history. And it's good to look back on the alternatives that once existed to the current AMD NVIDIA hegemony. Maybe things will change once again with Intel's discrete graphics solutions looming on the horizon. 
but until that day comes, one can always look back on the Realism 800 with the same melancholy fondness as the Matrox Parhelia, another graphics company's last hurrah. 3D Labs may not be remembered with the same fondness as a company like 3DFX, but its legacy, particularly with supporting and developing OpenGL, should not be forgotten. The graphics landscape would not be the same today if not for their contributions.